What's up, guys? It's Shannon, and welcome back to the Eheng Podcast. And today we will answer a question from email. Uh, this is from Lao. Hi, Sean. Wanted to get your thoughts on the long-term value of condos. In the case of landed properties within KL, because of land being a limited resource, it seems like over a 20 to 30 years period, it is almost guaranteed that the value of landed properties will appreciate. How about high-rise developments? If a condo in a relatively sought-after location, for example, Bukit Jaril, Hartamas, PJ, and etc., over 20 or 30 years, what would be the appreciation or depreciation be compared to a landed property? Barring extraordinary circumstances like the building having structural issues, landslide making the building unstable and etc. Just thinking that condos will age and even with good building management, facilities and common areas will inevitably age with time and start to look old. So how does the age of a condo affect the appreciation or depreciation of such properties? Thanks and regards. Lao. Now this is a very concise also very direct question so it's a very different turn compared to the questions that we always have let's just go into it so this topic of landed versus high-rise has always been a very hot debate right and in a very ideal situation in a utopia situation where we have both a landed and a high-rise price at the same price in the same location of course landed will be the best choice and if you look into the data by our official statistical department of malaysia the highest rate of capital appreciation for property types right sitting number one solidly is landed terrace house okay landed terrace house the next one following very close to that will then be high-rise apartments so when we talk about landed properties right landed properties is properties with land of course but then within this category there are also several other types like townhouse there's also cluster there's also semi d there's zero lot bungalows which is actually semi d and there are also bungalows and there are also residential land and mansion categories where it's like 12 million 15 million kind of category so the most popular one among all these landed product is still landed terrace house and if you look into the breakdown most of the time the corner lots always appreciates the most because it's seriously in between this category of landed terrace house and landed semi d's so going back to the narrative of landed versus high rise a terrace house versus a condo and the terrace house last time is around 1007 to 1008 square feet where you have a 22 by 80 feet size built two story and it says here that over a period of 20 to 30 years time right it's almost guaranteed that the value of landed properties will appreciate but if you look back into the locations of landed projects 20 to 30 years ago where are those properties right there's a park city damansara utama pj shah alam bukit jalutong area Buchong, subang and before the 20 30 years period it's like bangsa damansara heights and kind of things right so the the above addresses that were mentioned were already considered at the fringe of development and it's very hard to believe today but back then when Subang Jaya was up when the landed houses around Sunway Pyramid areas those were considered subpar locations subpar products because people back then is still talking about Bangsa Desa Park City was borderline blurry kepong Setio Eco Park was a lost leader but somewhat 20 30 years later that we look back today suddenly a lot of people then talk about hey you know last time if you buy a, now you fat that ready now you will make a lot of money actually if you 20 30 years ago you buy a, the first studio apartment in Pudu if you buy the first apartment around Mong Kiara, or you buy the apartments around Hatamas area you will equally make money as well and the main difference between these two categories right like just now we talk about the number Number one capital appreciation is actually landed terrace houses the second one close to that is apartments right but the main difference will be the ROI back then last time people will always buy with the mindset of flipping on it I buy I buy I buy then if you want I will sell if you want then I will sell they will usually not cut up on the rent at all because of the high selling price but for apartments then the way of investment is very very different although the capital appreciation is not as high but it comes with a very high ROI. This is also very weird. Lah. Like, why would people rent an apartment in PJ, for example, it's like 2005 to 2008 for a two to three bedroom unit, but they will never pay that rate for a landed terrace house. Why? It may be due to the level of securities. 
it may due to the level of facilities that's available within the project it may also be due to the size of the project not everybody wants big build-ups because sometimes big build-ups also means bigger burden to clean up bigger burden to maintain and this kind of discussion also is somewhat like an after the math discussion meaning when a township development begins right it always start with landed terrace houses why it's the nasi lemak property every malaysian especially Klang valley folks love nasi lemak no no i mean love the landed terrace houses so it's a very easy to go to market it's a product that every malaysian is very familiar you tell them 22 75 don't have to think really one they immediately know all oh, this one can buy and for developers it's very easy to push out also because malaysians get it it's very easy to introduce it's very easy to sell out and that becomes a good source of cash flow for the initial stage of the property so let's take uh elmina city of elmina as an example right they push out like maybe like four to six launches of landed terrace houses before they come with the shop lot before they come in with the school before they come in with the public resources like parks or lakes or whatsoever and if you look back it's the same with Subang Jaya where you have all the SS series and you have all the USJ series then you will have Shah Alam as well section 22, 24, 25 if you go back to Bukit Jalutong if you go back to Bukit Jaya as well Bukit Jaya used to be a compound where it's all luxury semi-dees and bungalows but as the land price starts picking up the scarcity starts kicking in developers don't no longer have the luxury to use such a canvas to build only 100 homes they now need to build 600 homes that's why only you come up with condominiums in order to cater for more population within that location itself that's why you look into the entire pj right the entire taman c la. technically the entire stretch across ldp la. it's all landed bandar utama is still all landed until today only at like seven to eight years ago then we only start seeing a lot more condo starts coming up so there's this element of timing that a lot of people refuse or they do not think about when we come into this discussion of landed versus high rise and last time high rise also because it was under the condominium category not yet service apartment so every land is condo right there was a restriction of 60 units per acre only and that results in the products of condominiums right we will have a layout of 1008 2000 square feet and very low dense with humongous facilities amazing stuff and if you bought those like now if you look into Hartamas, if you look into Monkara, the older apartments, right? I think it's superb value for investment. So these folks who have bought earlier, like 10, 15 years ago, they made their money. Is it as the same rate as the landed property? Like the data shows, it's not. But throughout the years, they have also collected rental. There's higher tendency for expats, for white collars to live in those high-rise settings. So to have a proper discussion about high-rise versus condo, right? We need to go into a situation where, for example, if you look into Serenia City, for example, a township by San Dabi around KLIA area, or if you look into Gamuda Gardens or Gamuda Cove, for example, the initial stage of townships, they will, of course, propose the safest product type. Again, the Nasi Lama property, the landed terrace houses and they will sell no matter how much you price right they will sell and only developers with history like those developers that i've just mentioned right that they bought they acquired the land long long time ago that's why they are able to play the longer game where they build out the whole community first so you'll be like landed terrace house and a terrace house a row of shop lot landed terrace house and a terrace house maybe a school or a park then maybe a mall, commercial area. Then when the price of the landed property starts peaking, where it's around 1.2 to 1.4 already. And the strategy of launching is also very similar. They'll launch the, the most familiar size, 22.75, at maybe 600,000. Then people start accepting. Then when I build again, then maybe phase two is going to be like 20.75 or 20.60. Then it's going to be like 80. 1560 maybe but the selling price is still almost the same it may go from 600,000 to 650 then to 620 then they will blur the line launch a series of semi -Ds. then they will launch a series of townhouses they will launch a series of clusters they will launch a series of super luxury homes or villas constantly trying to push different products so the acceptance level by the public is higher also blurring the right because ultimately 
who is keeping track. Only fanatics like myself are identifying lo. actually the price per square feet is getting higher and higher just that although they are buying lower ultimate price the size of the product is actually smaller. And now for landed products, we also need to talk about the design elements of it. So last time it was all individual title and then we now have landed strata title. So these two then will have a different category altogether. The strata fight one will usually be higher in selling price due to the requirements imposed where you need common areas and facilities such as swimming pool, gym. Practically it's just a high rise condo laid down horizontally and you will have all the rules in place where car parks you cannot change high park the roads are actually common space so you get to really have control over the entire taman the residence la. then for individual title houses then 20 to 30 years ago all the same the roads are public roads there's no guard house or whatsoever that when there was a time where the rate of break-ins were too high uh community starts controlling the access for a normal taman like OUG taman right you can come in from happy garden you can come in from Sri Petaling, you can come in from oakland road so technically there are a lot of access to the taman and that's actually convenience but convenience is always opposing security so this two usually don't come together like the more convenience the more access you get as a taman it's actually harder to secure the location so community starts coming together and they form RA which is resident association they need to get the whole taman registered then only they can start concealing the main roads then only have one in and one out in terms of access so with that then you can insert security posts or you can insert security guards to kind of control the cars in and out but then there was also an argument again back then where the RA do not have rights to stop anybody from passing your taman because the road is actually public road but as time passed by development starts kicking in the internal roads of taman eventually will become main roads or shortcuts to avoid traffic congestion so let's take pj for example ldp is always a nightmare to travel during peak hours so a lot of folks who are very familiar with the inner roads right they will take all the inner roads to avoid the traffic jam of ldp bandar utama as well OUG as well. So if you want to take a capital appreciation into context, right, the location of Tamas becomes a very huge factor to be considered within this discussion. Because like, if you're in the front row facing the main road, right, good luck with that. Technically, it's supposed to be the most convenient, but when your main road becomes the main access way of SS2, right, that's why a lot of them just give up and they just appeal to the local authorities and convert into commercial lots because the frontage is actually very good now as a shop, but it's actually terrible as a home and because your house is directly connected to the main circulation pathway of Petaling Jaya right there's no way that you can seal the entrance or the exit your unit becomes so open and then the narrative that I kind of develop is also when the prices reaches its peak so for example back then these houses were 300 400,000 for a landed terrace house right but when it's 800 to 900,000 people are still buying but when it reaches 1.2 to 1.5 for example so at 1.2 or 1.5 your income level as a household needs to be around 18 to 20 thousand with car as well and most likely the landed home is not your first property just assumptions at a household of 20 thousand right will you actually put your family in a home where there's no guarantee in security but this is me talking about landed home that is non-guarded where everyone can just come in and out you will have grab drivers directly hanging the food on your gate right those kind of setting actually very scary then also at that price range are you still in a stage where you want to quarrel with your neighbors on car park lots like the road next to the end lot right so whose car park is that i buy the end lot at a premium of course it belongs to me ma, but there's no rightful allocation of car park space or car park base in accordance to the agreement so technically it's free for all Originally, these products are starter homes back then, 30 years ago, right? These are starter homes for people to build their family and they start settling in. But now when the price gets too high at a peak, my theory, my theory is I believe that there will be a cap, especially for landed homes, 
without security, without guard house, because it's actually very, very challenging to also form a community to involve everybody. The core of individual title terrace houses, right, is I get to do whatever I want. Suddenly, when the community wants to start together, restricting this, now you need to come meetings, then now you need to pay a certain fee for security, right? What the hell? It was not the original setting, the original goal of the product, but now suddenly when I come in, my as well, I get a stratified project where every rule is laid out on the agreement. I cannot renovate, you also cannot renovate. If you want to renovate, we all get a say. And the challenging part for this discussion between condos versus landed, right, is the scarcity of land. Again, like if I can afford at the same price of a high rise and a landed home, of course I will pick a landed home in Mong Kiara. Who wouldn't want, right? Like you look into Daman Sara Heights as well. Like it was all mansions, it was all landed bungalows, it was all very nice, beautiful homes. But now you start seeing towers after towers after towers already. Then you will think about it. At the same price of 2 million, do I buy the condo that's attached to the mixed development and hotel or I buy an old London product that is non-gated because in within Tamansara Heights as well there are also a lot of landed bungalows where the roads are totally open and the inner roads became the main access way to the commercial lots so if you look into data the price of landed homes around popular locations such as Bangsa right such as Tamansara Heights has not escalated already because again the income level of the residents right has quadrupled maybe Maybe. then the priorities of life becomes different at this level at least for a home right I would expect security and safety and at that income level maintenance is not an issue anymore in fact they rather pay more for the maintenance of common areas instead of them doing it themselves because now if they were to travel all the time the house is not a burden so this was narration shared to me by my audiences who have moved from landed mansions into high rises they are tired of the build up when you're 30 to 40s of course 10,000 square feet of land is an absolute playground for the family but when you are 50 right and you are maintaining the house yourself mm, might as well i just move into a thousand five to thousand eight and, and this is what they call a phase of downsizing it's not necessarily that they are downgrading the level as they age they realize that one level of apartments becomes way more convenient and they don't need that many space like husband and wife and a maid, right? When they live at home, the upper floor is always empty. Nobody actually goes upstairs, especially if you have three stories, right? Nobody goes up to level three one. And when mobility becomes a problem, everybody starts shifting downwards. And when you want to sell your home of uh, 15 to 20 years, right? The buyer that is going to take over most likely is a young couple. is going to have a tough time affording it. Because now not only the selling price is high, the renovation fee scares people off. So, in order to buy a sub-sale property, upfront is 18%. And this is only a mere transfer of ownership. We haven't talked about renovation fee yet. We haven't talked about betterment fee yet. And the last point to this debate then will be the affordability. How many people can afford your landed house at 1.6 million? So recently, I have reviewed a few mansions or a few luxury homes, right? It's the same narrative, like when they buy last time, it was like 800,000, 900,000, now it's like 3 million, 4 million. But all of them are having a tough time to sell because at this price range of 3 to 4 million, right? It's a very small population that can afford it. Plus, not only to afford it, just think about it, if 3 million, right? If you take 90% loan, I don't think they will take 90% loan, but just assuming like they take 90% loan, now payment is 300,000. Then renovation usually is another three to 400,000, especially at this current time where material price are just crazy. So upfront 600,000 before moving in. This will be only the top 5% in Malaysia that is able to afford products of this kind of category. Plus, at this price range, the choices around are in abundance. There are so many other homes at 3 million. You get what I mean? So even if I have the money, why must I buy yours? Especially when now the, the road in front of your house becomes a highway or suddenly you are just an outcast within your taman where it's almost impossible to guard your entrance. Then for those who come from nothing, right? At this stage, it will always be a debate between spending that money for a dream home for the family or I will just delay the sense of gratification a little bit, then make my money work for me instead. Indirectly, this means that I don't have to necessarily own a dream home of 3 million. 
how about me renting a semi D at 4,000 a month? It's actually way cheaper to rent a luxury mansion while deploying my money in several investment apartments in Mong Kera area, KLCC area, Teras area, whatever lah, right? To generate ROI for me. Because the concern is if I were to silang everything, if I were to just put in everything in one home, right? And that 3 million now becomes 4 million in 20 years time, who is going to buy? You get what I mean? So we kind of discussed also about the school of thought of different investment strategies. So when I invest, as long as the renter can cover my installments, right, I will just hold it until 30 years later, I fully own the unit. Another way is to measure when now my ROI is 7% when I acquire it. Maybe 10 years later, the price starts going upwards eventually it will go up because there are many examples where the rent actually translates into capital appreciation for high-rise apartments. So when you acquire a 7%, maybe 10 years later, in accordance to the market price is 5 or 5 percent then you exit and you buy new ones that's also a strategy so it depends which school of thought are you both are correct it depends on your risk appetite it also depends on your income level it also depends on your level of experience there are a lot of audiences actually look into the us home flipping kind of situation right they will have conversations around single family home or multiple family home to us is high rise and landed it's a very different narrative altogether the financing mechanism by banks are also very different so we cannot really just plug and play whatever they teach in us into malaysia context it doesn't work at all so in conclusion i didn't expect to talk so much about this also but it has been a very very hot topic all this while if given a choice if given a choice, if I go back like 15 years ago, then I just graduate only. <laughs> anyway, or you, you put me like 25 years ago, right? I would buy as many homes as possible around PJ, around Banda Utama, around Hatamas, around Subang, around anywhere. Like technically, every location in 25 years ago, whatever you buy would have made money. Don't go and buy Bukit Beruntung. Lah. Uh, practically all those with infrastructure, right? all have made money but if you translate it into today's context if you look into brand new townships across Semenye, across Nilai, across Kela IA area, across northern parts, you have the Gambuda Gardens or Rawang, right? Those are new locations, new potential that is exactly like 25 years ago. But now, will you invest in those locations? So the moral of the story is it's very easy to look back, right? And say that, hey, yo, last night if I buy, right, so I make money. But now you are given the opportunity to buy. Are you buying? So if I can afford, so if I'm an offspring of a public listed Tan Sri family, I will buy stacks of landed homes in the city, stacks of commercial lots in the city. Of course, I will buy those. Even without financing, I will buy. Why waste time on condos? Why waste time on service apartment? Every year, ROI 6%, 7%. It's a waste of time. But how many of us have like 150 million lying around, nothing to do? how I wish <laughs> it would happen to me also, right? So it's a very, very interesting question. Although it's short, but you just triggered a lot of things within me. <laughs> and I guess that's all for this email. Thank you so much, Lau, for sending in the email. And for those who still have any questions regarding real estate, do just email me at T-A-N-I-H-E-R-N-G, T-A-N-I-H-E-R-N-G at gmail.com, or you can just DM me on Instagram, I-H-E-R-N-G. And I'll see you on the next one. Ciao.